<clears throat> well, church, if you've been coming uh, for a few weeks, you know that we've been in Proverbs. Uh, we're going through the teachings of Proverbs, and we come this morning to chapter 3 of Proverbs. And I forgot on my time away from the church what page that is in your pew Bible, so somebody can tell uh, someone if they're using the pew Bible, but hopefully you'll turn yours on or borrow one or uh, you use what you have in front of you because we're going to be going through Scripture this morning. We've been learning some great things, not only of the path in which to live, but wise sayings from the Lord. Nestled between the passages of wisdom that we found in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we now find the passage of trust in the Lord. One of the most well-known passages in Proverbs, the first eight verses of chapter 3, it's called trust in the Lord. And we have seen in the last few weeks wisdom's plea to us. We've seen uh, wisdom's worth. We've seen uh, all kinds of things as to the person of wisdom. And next week, we'll see wisdom's happiness to the person who finds wisdom. In all these passages, we have seen wisdom is a person. We can't forget this. Uh, Solomon personifies wisdom to his son. And we've learned through God's word that wisdom is the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24 says. Church, we, we gather together each week so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be revealed. Even so, we come together and through the word, we impart a secret wisdom, a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, which God has decreed before the ages for our glory. This is what the Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. So the question is, how is it, even in church, that so many lives are resting in the wisdom of men instead of the power of God? Why is the church so weak when it comes to wisdom from God? I believe there's two primary reasons that come from Scripture. The first one we find in Colossians 3.16, and the command, the admonition to the church is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It goes on to say, so that we are neither, uh, because, because it's not dwelling in us richly, we are not teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. We're not singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in our hearts to God. And so we come to the second reason in James chapter 1, which reads, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. For God gives generously to all without reproach. How serious, having gone, if you've been here and you've heard these messages from Proverbs through the first two chapters... How serious are we, let me make it personal, how serious are you to obtain the wisdom of God? The word of Christ dwelling richly in believers is needful. And asking God for the very wisdom needed, the wisdom that comes from God, who is Jesus Christ, is needful. As we move to Proverbs 3 this morning, we see again the words, my son. Let me, let me read the first eight verses, and then I'll, I'll be going through them. I don't want you to close your Bibles after we get done reading the Scripture. I want you to keep them open so you'll see some things. But he says, My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your, hearts, let your heart keep my commands. For they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard with God and people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know Him, and He will make your paths straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. We see the words, my son. Solomon conti continues to teach his son. 
Solomon continues his training, and we in this sanctuary as parents, as children and followers of Christ, we can do nothing less than listen and apply this teaching. If we ever take our hearts away from the learning and applying of God's Word, listen, church, we take our very existence away from God's presence and protection and blessings. God, according to the Word of God, the truth, God is always near us. The question is, are we always near God? I believe we can answer this question, are we near God, through the instruction of Proverbs chapter 3 in these first eight verses. Solomon says, my son, it's like God speaking to us when we come to our quiet place in devotion. We open up his word and we, we pray to him through what we have learned in the word. And God says at that moment, my child... Church, I want you to never forget the very precious right that we have in Jesus Christ. It's found in John chapter 1. It says that to all who receive him, that's taking in Christ through faith, all who receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, to those born of God. When he he says born of God, he means those who are born from above by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in his word. What God has said is true. Faith in the cross that he has forgiven you for your sins. And faith in his resurrection. Because Christ is risen, we too shall rise. We have new life in Christ Jesus. Receiving him in faith, we now receive the right to become children of God. So we open his word and our father says to us as we read, my child, my son. My daughter, listen. Just as Solomon was instructing his child, God speaks to us through his written word. I want you, if you take notes, to write three things down from our teaching in this text. I want you to remember that these first eight verses talk about a remembering. It talks about a steadfastness. And it talks about a trusting. You can't take one without the other. They all build on each other. We need a remembering, we need a steadfastness, and we need a trusting. Solomon was teaching his son to remember and not forget, to have a a steadfast love and faithfulness, and to trust in the Lord. Remember what has been taught so far. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Remember that fear is not a phobos, a a fear of fright, but it's a fear of respect. Because God said it, I will listen. Because God said it, I will do. That's called fear of the Lord. We obviously have no fear if we see something in the word of God that is unholy to him and we participate in it. We give more fear, we give more respect to the sin than to the holiness of God. And so to acquire wisdom, we need a strong Fear, respect of the Lord. There is but one right path that we have been learning. And wisdom calls out in public places to get our attention. So knowing these things, Solomon speaks first to a strong remembrance. He says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Now, two weeks ago, we saw that when Solomon refers to his teaching and to his commandments... He's referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And starting uh, in verse 6, he says, These words that I command you. This is God speaking. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Look at that. Before you can teach your children something to place on their heart, what must you have? The word on your heart. Do you see how, how God flows his family? He, he, says, he, he says, These words that I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently that's carefully that's with care to your children you shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way when you lie down and when you rise up you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be like frontlets between your eyes you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates now solomon was saying son don't forget my teaching what he's saying is son don't forget what i've said what god said Have we parents reminded our children not to forget what God has said? Have we started with our own hearts and said, let's not forget what God has said so that we can be the model, the example to our children? 
In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon asked God when God came to him, he asked God for wisdom and God gave him wisdom, just as James tells us he will do. The Bible says all Israel heard about the judgment that Solomon had given and they stood in awe of the king. Why? Because they saw that God's wisdom was in him to carry out justice. What would it look like if the church had the full wisdom of God living and acting in the full wisdom concerning the justice that is in our nation right now? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 28, and for the flowing verses, it talked about Solomon had 3,000 proverbs that he spoke. His songs numbered 1,005. How, how many hymns, praises do you know to sing, to write, to quote to God? Uh, These songs that we sing together in congregation, are they on your heart during the week to praise God with? I believe the two greatest books you can carry with you, obviously, is the Word of God, the Bible. And next to that is, and I'm particular about this, the Southern Baptist hymnal. Because within those hymns are the scripture that are sung out, and we can give praise to God. He had 3,000 proverbs. He had 1,005 songs. Solomon's wisdom, we are told, was greater than the wisdom of the people of the East, greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone, says 1 Kings chapter 4. God gave Solomon wisdom, and he taught this wisdom to his child. He taught this wisdom to the nation that he ruled over. And by extension, because of the Holy Spirit, Solomon's words teach us, the church, even this day. Deuteronomy 6 instructed children to be taught daily, and here's the key, in all areas of life. The reason the Word of God is important is it deals with all of our life, not just our Sunday life. The reason the Word of God is important is it deals with all of our hearts. Even those parts of the heart that we think that we've sectioned off and said, God, this is my area. No. The person walking with God, all heart belongs to God. As you move through Scripture, we see uh, in a like manner, God says, when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord. You know what he's saying? When you're satisfied, when you're blessed, When you're living a life of full blessings, he says, take care lest you what? Forget the Lord. Now, remember is what he's saying. Solomon's teaching his child to remember. God said, when you're satisfied, be careful lest you forget the Lord. The key word here is remember. And it's obvious that if the Holy Spirit must breathe out on his writers to say, do not forget, that is, remember, then obviously we must be very forgetful children. Amen? I mean, look in your own household, and when you say to do something and how it doesn't get done, what's the first thing they say? I forgot. The husband who was supposed to pick up milk, what's the first thing he says when he got home? I What's the first thing when we get caught in sin? We forgot the commands of the Lord. The Holy Spirit says, remember. When we have great blessings, like when we eat and are full and our refrigerators have more food and our house is blessed, forgetfulness to the gratefulness of God can seep into your life. Let me say that again. When you are living a life of blessings, the forgetfulness to the greatness of God can seep in and take over your life. For example, we can become skillful in a task. Uh, uh, For you guys who have a church ministry, I want you to think about the church ministry for a moment. But we can become skillful in that task. We, we've been there. We've done that for 10 years or more. And instead of remembering to seek God's way in that ministry and blessing in the task through God, we say something like this in our heart. I, I got this, Lord. I've been here. I've got the T-shirt. I know what to do. Or maybe when we have gone through so much and we have maturity and wisdom that has been given to us, we become confident in ourselves instead of remembering God who gives all good things from above. Pastors are no exception to this. After 17 years of of preparing and studying and coming to Saturday night to get ready for Sunday morning, it's easy to say, I've been there. If I see a text that I'm familiar with, it's easy to say, I got this. But if I speak to you, you have no benefit or blessing. If God speaks to us, we have his presence and his power and his wisdom. So we can't trust in ourselves. We can't rely upon ourselves. We are looked to get 
we are to look, we are to, look to remember God. Scripture over and over tells the child of God to remember. Deuteronomy 4, 4 9 says, Be careful. Watch yourselves closely. Do we practice that, church? Do we, after doing something, step back and reflect why we did something, what we did in that something, and how that something came about? Do we examine ourselves closely? The reason it says, be careful, watch yourselves closely, is because Nehemiah in chapter 4 said, remember the Lord. In, in Psalm, the psalmist says, on your bed, remember God and think of Him through the night. The Holy Spirit says, remember in your youth. The Holy Spirit says, when you're scattered to distant places, when you're in strange lands and places, when you're moving about in the life that God has given you, remember, he says. And the Holy Spirit says, even when life is ebbing away, we, we've hit the, the golden years, and we know there's less grass in the front than there is behind. He says, confess this, I remember you, Lord. My prayer rises to you. The question is, how do we express remembering God? And the way that we express this is to recall His teaching and place in our hearts His commandments, as Solomon writes here. We, we remember God when we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. We remember God greatly when we love our neighbors as ourselves. Yes, when we love even our enemies, those who would be against us. We remember God greatly when we teach and instruct our children the ways of God and what He said to do. Jesus said, love one another. As I have loved you, so love one another. That's remembering. That's recalling. That's practicing. That's glorifying the name of God, His teachings, His commandments in your heart. Have you ever reflected on love one another, even your enemies? Have you ever reflected on that? Culture says if somebody's aggravated you, aggravate them back. Culture says if someone hurts you, ignore them. Distance yourself from them. God says when someone hurts you, treat them with kindness. God says when someone would treat you as an enemy, pour out love and kindness so as to be like heaping coals of fire on their head. Why don't we do that, church? Many of us have known each other in here 30, 40 years. And yet the slightest thing can aggravate us not to have us talk to each other for two weeks. How is that possible? Because we forget God. We forget what God demonstrated on the cross of Calvary toward us. The next time you're upset with someone, the next time you're having a hard time struggling, loving someone, I want you to remember something. When was the last time you aggravated God in disrespect? Did he come to you in prayer and say, uh, I'm not hearing you today because I'm going to take two weeks off from you. I'm mad at you. Of course not. If that was the case, God would not be just. And if that were the case, then his blood would not be effectual. So the question is, is our heart rendered to God effectual to him? Do we remember God? If we forget his teachings, if we forget not his teachings, I should say, and we have his commandments written in our heart, Proverbs 3, 2 says, we have the strong promise, look at this, of the length of days and years of life and peace added to us. Now, you don't have to go to Google to see what the number one thing people are looking for. But it's length of days and it's peace. The, this nation is consumed with trying to add years to our life. And right here, if we just remember God, we have long life and peace. The question is, how can I have many long and prosperous years of life bathed in peace? The answer is, remember his teaching and let your heart keep his commandments. The Bible says, the nation that forgets God returns to the grave. Did you know that, church? That's not a pretty picture, is it? We don't want to return to the grave. What do we want to do? 
Rise up in victory. Rise up in new life. Yet the Holy Spirit says, the nations that forget God return to their graves, Psalm 9, 17. Isaiah teaches that forgetting God leads to constant terror in our lives. Anybody deal with anxiety? Excessive worry that brings you so low you can't get up in the morning? Do you have these things that, that bear down on you? It could be, it could be other than a test, it could be your trial not to forget God. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, reminds us that forgetting God leads to bitter tears and even weeping. People of all nations, gender, cultures, ethnicity, we all seek long life. Nobody ever grows up thinking, I want to die young. We, we search for long life. People want peace, and right here in God's Word is the promise for both. Our national budget from Congress spends some $600 billion a year to keep peace or to have peace in this nation. Did you know that? Our government spends, not, not individual families, our government spends your taxpaying dollars, $67 billion a year on health care to pursue a care for longer life of the citizens. Households, that's you and me, spend billions on care products. I, I got tired of writing the numbers. I just stopped and said billions. What we spend on care products to make ourselves look younger, hair color, makeup, all that stuff, make us look younger. We're striving for long life. We want peace in our life. We spend billions on counseling for reconciliation, for addictions that have caused us harm, for for pain that we can't escape from. We pay billions of dollars for this, and yet the vast majority of people take zero time or effort to remember God. And that holds the promise of the length of years in peace. The next time you are down and out, lift your head up and remember God. He will bring you through. How much blessing can God give us this day if from this point forward, we pursue God with a white-hot passion, how could your life radically change this moment, this very moment, if we stopped pursuing the stuff of the world and we pursued God with all of our heart? Second thing Solomon speaks is to a persevering steadfastness to his son. A persevering, that is an unquitting steadfastness. In life. Verse 3 says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. That's the ESV version of what I read from the Christian Standard Bible. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Love and faithfulness. Both of these run vertically and horizontally. Vertically to God. Let not your steadfast love and faithfulness to God forsake you. Why? Because God loved me, I can love you. Because God showed his love to me, I can show love to others. i got to get my vertical right before I can go horizontal. And we're all the time trying to take care of horizontal relationships between one another. And the whole problem with our horizontal relationships is our vertical relationship stinks with God. It stinks because of sin that we won't repent from. It stinks because of sin that we cherish in our heart. And it causes us anger. It causes us brokenness with one another. Solomon says to his son, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. The horizontal is your one another. People in this church, your neighbors, even those who would treat you as enemies. Love God, love one another. You can't start here loving one another until you get God right in your life. And Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Did you catch that? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now hold on to your hat because you're going to see something in a moment. But basically what that's saying, if anyone loves Jesus, this is his word. I must keep it. All of it. You know, things like the creation. Things like men roles, women roles in life. Things like what sin is that I must reject. I have to I must keep this if I love God. That's heavy. Because over 60% of the church is rejecting parts of the Bible and claiming to be Christian. 
Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Love is a keeping of God's word. Obeying what God has said. Uh, Brother Bill and I heard in a conference this week, uh, one of our seminary presidents retired this year and they brought him up on the stage and I don't know how old he is, but he looked a lot older than me. And he was retiring, and they said, what can you tell young pastors? What word of wisdom can you give young pastors? You know what he said? One word, obey. Obey. And yes, that's the one thing we fight against every day in our life. Amen? Oh, come on, say amen. I know you do. I'm just like you. Obeying what God has said. Love is an action, not a feeling. God first loved us in that he sent his son to pay the penalty, the penalty for our sins. And in Christ we have life. Faithfulness is to God's word and then blessings flow. God's word is Jesus Christ who is the wisdom and the power of God. Unfaithfulness to God's word leads to brokenness, leads to sorrow, and leads to judgment. Faithfulness leads to blessings in this life and life eternal. Solomon says to his child, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. I actually want you to turn to 1 John with me. That's at the end of the Bible, just before Jude and Revelation. It's short, so you might go flying by there if you're not careful, but it's 1 John. And I want you to turn to chapter 2. Now I'm going to start with verse 2 while you're turning there, because I want to show you something, uh, a very shocking statement that the Holy Spirit gives us this morning. In verse 2, he says, he himself, the he is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You can catch that in verse 1. The context is Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus Christ himself is the atoning sacrifice. I want to stop there. The the better translations have that old-fashioned word that we don't hear anymore, propitiation. Propitiation means an action. Did you catch that? Not a feeling. An action meant to regain someone's favor or make up for something that was done wrong. Propitiation is a sacrifice, but it comes from the Latin verb propitiare, and it means to appease. Here's what the world doesn't understand. Uh, Forget the world for a moment. Here's what the church doesn't understand. Sin offends God. And when you offend God, you receive the wrath of God, unless you have the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the blood of Jesus Christ appeased, made better, made God feel right toward your sin. Can you imagine the judgment of the millions and billions in this world without the blood of Jesus Christ? The wrath of God still remains on them. But right now in this sanctuary, if you're without Jesus Christ and you're suffering the wrath of God, you can come to Jesus in his love demonstrated on the cross of Calvary and he'll wipe the slate clean. Past, present, and future. That's That's propitiation. Jesus Christ did that for us on the cross. So in that context, look what he says. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, verse 2, and not only for ours, but also for the what? The whole world. All those people who are evil and wicked and get under your skin, Jesus died for them too. And so I can love them because Jesus loves them. Now look at verse 3. This is how we know. Stop there. I always like to call this passage, this is how we know that we know that we know that we know. This is how we know. In other words, this is proof positive of where you belong right now with God. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. A Christian, a faithful follower, a believer, a church member, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a preacher. doesn't matter. Those titles are worthless. Here's how you know that you know that you know Jesus Christ. Knowing Jesus Christ is salvation. Here's how you know. If we what? Keep his commands. Whew. Well, pastor, what if I keep 90% of them? You got 10% to go. Get busy. Well, pastor, how do I do that? Hold tight. We're going to talk about that in a second. Verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know Jesus and yet doesn't keep Jesus' command is a... Wow. I didn't say that. The Holy Spirit just said that. And the truth is not in that person. Verse 5. But whoever keeps this word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know that we are in Jesus. The one who remains in him should walk just as Jesus walked. 
You want to know why Paul, after 30 years in ministry, starting all kinds of churches, even up into Europe, said, I want to know Jesus and him crucified? I always read that in the Bible. I'm like, Paul, man, if anybody knew Jesus, you knew Jesus. And Paul, 30 years into the ministry, confessed, I want to know Jesus and him crucified. Why? Because if I don't know him, I can't walk as him. If I don't walk as him, I'm a liar. I'm not, I do not know Jesus. You say, well, is it that serious, pastor? Yeah, it's that serious. Well, is there any wiggle room here? No, the Holy Spirit gave you no wiggle room. You either are or you are not. There's no going to get there. You either are there or you are not. This is how we know him. We walk as him, and we also keep his word. Now, specifically to Jesus, what was Jesus' word? He first of all said, believe in me. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus, in his great prayer, the high priestly prayer, he, 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 he prayed to his father. He said, Father, may they know you and the one you sent. This is eternal life. God put his stamp of approval on Jesus Christ. He never put, God never put his stamp of approval on any other man past, present, or future. Jesus Christ is the approval to salvation. That means if you're going through anyone else, any other religion, any other practice, any thought, you are separated from God right now. Jesus Christ is the one God set his seal upon. So Jesus said, believe in me. Have you done that? And number two, he said, eternal life is in believing in the one God sent. Because God knew our condition. He knew we were to receive his wrath. He made the way. He took care of the wrath by sending his son. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Jesus took the wrath of God for you. You say, but pastor, the most I've ever done is stole a cookie out of a cookie jar. Does that really deserve hell? Yes. Well, that seems kind of unfair. Doesn't matter. That's God's rules. Because if you really looked at God's word, you would see that you've done more than take a cookie out of a cookie jar. You will see what mankind has done from the beginning. You and me before Christ, we spit in the face of God with our disrespect. You say, I've never done that. Take a good, close examination of yourself. Give an honest assessment before Christ. And you'll see how despicable we are separate from Christ Jesus. Church, a persevering steadfastness brings favor and good success. Look at verse 4, in, back in Proverbs in our text. A persevering steadfastness brings favor and good success. And now we can talk about prosperity because we put the truth in front of us who is Jesus Christ. Jesus grew up in the wisdom and the favor of God and man. You remember that statement about Jesus at the age of 12? Have you grown up in the favor of God and men? Have you been blessed with good success? I'm not talking monetarily only. I'm talking your walk with Jesus. I'm talking your your time with your children, your marriage. I'm talking all areas of your life. God says if you will have a persevering steadfastness, he will bring favor and good success on your life. Well, can you prove that, Pastor? Yes, start listening to God and you will see. But if we keep denying it, we'll just keep living the same redundant, sinful lives that cause us harm and suffering. Favor with God and man. Good success. I mean, look at, look at the great reward we have seen so far by traveling the narrow path. Years of life and peace. Now we see favor and success. Again, men and women are seeking these things separate from God. And they come up short. But those in Christ have victory in life today, but they also have victory in life eternal. Why? Because God promised it, and God does not lie. God promised it, and it comes through not forgetting God and having a persevering steadfastness toward love and faithfulness. Now, finally, Solomon speaks to a trusting. This is the part most people are very familiar with in Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord, he writes in verse 5. Trust in the Lord. Not just a perfunctory, that is an unthinking mechanical trust, but a trust with your whole self. That is your heart, that is your soul, that is your mind, that is your very strength. 
And he says that it's an abandonment, a total abandonment. Think of yourself as dropping yourself on the floor and walking away from yourself. A total abandonment to trusting in yourself so that you can trust completely in the Lord through his word. Trust in. We must constantly examine where we have placed our trust, church. It can easily slip to a greater trust in ourself, our education, our jobs, our money, our material stuff, and on and on and on. We are called to a singular trust in the Lord, an exclusive trust in the Lord. And not just a religious trusting, but he writes, in all of your ways acknowledge him, In all of your ways. We cannot separate our trust between a religious life and a secular life. Let's be honest right now. Pastors do this too, so let's be honest, all of us in this sanctuary. Does your Monday look like your Sunday? Does your Tuesday look like your Sunday? Does your Wednesday look like your Sunday? Does your Thursday look like your Sunday? Does your Friday look like your Sunday? Does your Saturday look like your Sunday? Does your life look consistently in the Lord? Do we look good on Sunday, but dress like the world Monday through Saturday? How about this one? Do we come to church Sunday morning, and within 15 minutes after leaving church, we become who we were all week long? Or do we go out these doors refreshed, edified, built up in the Lord to serve Him with all of our heart and strength, soul and mind? Do we try to, well, that's my work life. I, I I can't behave like that in work. I got to be like this in work. And at church, I got to be like this. And oh, in front of my wife, I better be like this. And in front of my children, I got to act like this. God wants you to stop that nonsense that's full of sin. And he wants you to surrender yourself before him right now and give him all of yourself to God. He says, is it that serious, pastor? Do you consider eternal life serious? Do you consider knowing Jesus who is your savior serious? The word of God doesn't trifle. The word of God is power. And it's for the salvation of our soul. He says, trust in the Lord. Abandon yourself. Trust in the Lord. Don't separate your your life out in different areas, but in all your ways acknowledge him. In Christ we have been made new and so that our whole self belongs to the Lord. And this by faith alone. The Bible also says the righteous The righteous means those who are justified. Those who are made right with God. How are we made right? Through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He says those who are made right, those who are righteous, those who have the blood of Jesus, the righteous live by faith. Faith is synonymous with trust. The teaching goes further. In this trust in the Lord, we are to not be wise in our own eyes. Culture needs to hear this. The church culture, that is. Not to be wise in our own eyes, but instead what? Fear the Lord. There it is again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And as we fear the Lord, we turn away from evil. We either fear God more not to do the evil, or we fear the evil more than God to do the evil. And every day we make these decisions. He says, fear the Lord. We won't embrace what is unholy to God if we fear the Lord. We will reject it. We will flee it. We will repent of it even when we are deceived. And so if I slip and fall today, if I fear the Lord, I'll immediately repent, change, ask for forgiveness, and move on in the Lord. Remember God's teachings and commandments. This takes trust in the Lord because we fear the Lord. And God blesses the faithful by being a healing to their flesh. Look at verse 8. What's the reward? What's, What's the blessing if we fear the Lord, if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart? healing to our flesh, and even refreshment to your bones, saith the Lord. My favorite verse in Psalm is, Return the joy of your salvation to me, Lord. Return the joy of your salvation. It's a healing to my body. So remember God's teachings. Be steadfast in love and faithfulness and trust in the Lord. If you do this, great is your reward in Christ. Long years of life and peace, good success and favor with God and men, A healing and a refreshment will come to you as a dear friend would come to you even in the greatest trial you would face. Yet if we forget God, we return to the grave. Psalms 9, 17. If we do not remain steadfast, 
we fall away. We can become apostate. We can reject what we once believed. We can renounce our faith if we do not remember God. If we don't trust the Lord, we become like waves tossed on the ocean as Minister Gaines read to us from James. Our houses will be like houses built on sand so that when the storms of life come, we will perish. But if we trust in the Lord, even in those storms, we will receive victory today and for life eternal. Wisdom's path is trust in the Lord. We've heard wisdom's plea. We've seen wisdom's worth. Next week, we're going to see wisdom's happiness. You can hear all that, but unless you trust in the Lord with all of your heart, remember God, steadfast in your love and faithful, you'll never acquire wisdom. Trust in the Lord. Trust is shown in obedience. I'm going to close by reading to you one of my favorite hymns. I'll spare you the singing it to you. But I want you to know that when you read the Bible, a good practice is to find a hymn that strengthens the word of God that you just read so that you can repeat it to the Lord. This is one of those hymns that I have used probably since I was 11 or 12 years old. You'll notice Trust and Obey. It's page 447 in your hymnal. I'm not going to read all the verses, but I'm going to read the 1, 3, and 4 because those are the ones that apply to this morning's instruction. John Samoth penned these words, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, that's the Bible, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Let us do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Can I pause for a moment? Some of my loved ones are struggling because you won't lay on the altar what God has asked you to lay on the altar. Some of you guys keep repeating hurt in your lives because instead of laying it on the altar, you keep taking it back and showing affection to it. Take that affection and cast it to the Lord. Cast it to the Lord. Lay it on the altar. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet. Or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there is no other way. Next week, we're going to see that wisdom brings happiness before we can have that blessing of God's happiness upon us in wisdom, we have to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord is remembering God, having a steadfast faithfulness and love, and putting our whole life, every area of our life, in God's hands. So the call is real simple this morning. If we're walking without Jesus in the sanctuary, the first fresh look we need to take is to the cross of Calvary. For there the blood of Jesus has covered, paid for, my sin. For those of us who walk in Jesus, maybe it's a sloppy walk. Maybe it's a sporadic walk. Maybe your walk right now is in total victory. Wherever your walk is, we need to take these three things from Proverbs chapter 3. And we need to recommit them to our heart. Why? Because the Holy Spirit breathed out those words on Solomon to teach his son and by extension us today. They're God's words. And he's given us the path to a blessed life. Remember God, steadfast love and faithfulness, and trust in the Lord in all your ways. Lean not unto your own understanding. Go back and look at the blessings, the reward that God gives. And then you have to ask yourself this question, and I'm done. Is God who you're going to rend your whole self to? Give it all. Lay it at the altar. 
Or are you going to keep chasing after what the world gives and getting the same results? With God, each day is new. With the world, it's the same sorrow, brokenness, and hurt. But with each day, God sends refreshment to our flesh and to our bones. Which do you want? Whom do you fear? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we come into this hymn of invitation, that it would be an invite to our hearts to come clean with you. And to confess to you, I remember you, God. My prayer rises to you. Just the sheer joy of knowing that no matter where we've walked this week, where we were yesterday, today we are in your presence and you have called out and we can respond and we can receive your love even now at this very moment. Lord, I pray that if there is one in here struggling, with his what, what is known as a besetting sin, one that we just, we just can't seem to get away from. Lord, I pray that you would empower them to see your glory and to trust in you. For you are just and faithful to forgive. Lord, maybe there's just some that are walking and there's, it's not a valley, it's not a trial, it's not a struggle, but it's not the blessings either. And it's just kind of like mediocre. It's not, it's not dynamic. It's not filled with your joy. Lord, I pray that we would turn our attention to you and that we would see your freshness, we would see your joy, we would see your peace anew. And that you would appoint us and anoint us with your purpose and with your call. I pray, Lord, that you would take us from these doors out into the community, filled with your love, and that each day we would seek your presence the more, and that we would not forget you, but remain in a steadfast love and faithfulness toward you, and that in all of our ways, in every area of our life, we will trust in you, our mighty God. Thank you for this time in your word, and I ask blessings now in the invitation. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with